everybody, and I want to welcome you all to our Arizona History Happy Hour as we are coming to you live from the Arizona Heritage Center. Now, it's going to be really exciting because you know what? We are going to celebrate New Year's every hour on the hour, and I think we're getting close to a top of the hour. So, how close are we? One minute. One minute. Okay. So, all right. So, five, four, three, Two, one, yay! All right, so then we have that. And then we should do that. And then I think we are good to go. And I can hear my phone out there being annoying. And I'll know you're upstairs because I'm watching. Because you can, you could, you'll be able to see us. Okay. Because <laughs> I wanted it to be some place where. <laughs> yes, exactly. My phone, my phone's loud, but I've got the volume cranked up. So. Well, and you know, when you're here, you have to check out every little. Oh, it was doing good. Oh, God, again, it's okay. Yeah, you're doing good. And here we are. We are going up into the museum. We're getting ready for a live broadcast, a live tour right here from the Arizona Heritage Center. It's kind of exciting. Oh, my gosh. So we are going to be doing a tour from six to seven and then have our usual happy hour from seven to eight. So we've got several folks. I mean, we've got Todd, we have Jen. So we're going to have a lot of fun. I will hand off the phone to Jen. Okay. Um, so one of the things is this plane, which was kind of interesting because I thought it was all one plane, probably from one place, maybe. Arizona on it, but it's actually made up of multiple planes. It's kind of a just a hodgepodge of all these different parts they found, and it was more used to represent the fact that military was, and Air Force was so big here in Arizona. And so that's what the plane is doing, as opposed to being just a plane, but it's symbolizing all the other planes around. Come on in. Let's look in. Let's go. Now look at this. When we talk at desert cities, Arizona welcomes you. And you know, I mean, from the dust bowl on, people have just been coming and coming and coming to the valley. I mean, right now, Arizona is like one of the top growing places in the country. People are moving here from all over the place. But how are they doing it? Well, you know, in the early days and even now, they fill everything in the U.S. And what I think is really cool is they have their international headquarters right here in Phoenix, right over on Central Avenue. I mean, look at how beautiful this trade looks. Much smaller to haul than some of the big ones you get today. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, exactly. So, but I just love. I mean, look at how it's doing. I mean, this whole. I mean, it's like you hold this a great job when we did this training. So very. Well, let's go on and start to show you what the valley was looking like in terms of just the population explosion. And one of the things I love about this wall is if you start looking, you get to see so many different cultures showing up. It's not just the Anglo culture, but the Hispanic culture, the Black culture. You see so many different things. And then you see places like Puerto Rico, Oh my gosh. So the softball teams 
it's like this is such a great little kind of representation of Somo and Blake. When you talk about Blakely, I mean, the rocket that you used to be able to ride in, as well as now, all the glasses that everyone still collects. We have a collection of the glasses here. Oh, I didn't realize that. We oh, do. cool. Well, maybe we'll, will we see those, or are they, on, or are they in the- they are in the, our, they are in the collection, so we'll have to. We did have a Facebook post about them recently, uh, so you'll have to check our uh, Facebook okay. page. <laughs> So this is just such a great representation of the diversity that we find. But then you see it's like, you know, back in 1940, like 180,000 people. Then, I mean, and now it's into the millions. It's a very different place than it was not even that long. So come on in, let's go through and take a look at some stuff. Um, so, you know, it was so funny. And I was like, why is there this house here? And then we started talking about John F. Long and what he did. And this was kind of his vision of a house of the future. Solar panels. And I, mean, I love that when you start looking at the house of the future, it's like if you look, I don't know if you're able to tell, but it's obviously a late 70s house with that little archway and everything there. But you know, not. Um, I was just chatting with a friend, Brad, and he was talking about how in Ahwatukee, there was a house of the future there, like in the 60s and 70s. Oh, really? So I need to find out more about that. He said he went on a class field trip. And then let's see, what do we got over here? Um, Chandler. Chandler, with lots of power, Oh, but then I, I just, Oh, but there's Torea, yeah. Yeah, so this is the stock. Like, oh. Like, so this is the stock. So we've got Torea Castle right there. So I mean, there's just so much stuff. All of them are turned off right now during COVID. Uh, <laughs> but yes. Okay, so probably we're just going to I hope they turned up for taking it. That was the point. I didn't even ask Jenny Fox. Yes, right. So, Jenny Arizona was designing the car. And one thing I love about this is this is actually from a newsreel that you told about at Monroe School about kids learning to drive using pedal cars. Oh, wow. There's actually, it's like a 20 minute video. It's like, at some point I would love to show it just because it's so much fun with Jimmy Stewart narrating and all these little kids driving their cars, beep, beep. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, you really get to see how transportation, I mean, rush hour. Oh my gosh, you know? Has it changed? <laughs> Has it changed? What to suddenly, boom, lots of rush hour. Maybe not as bad as some other places, but still more than we're used to seeing. And then public transit, which we used to have a really good train system, then that kind of burnt down. Then buses came along, and now we're going back to trains, which is really interesting. And then this made me just talking about how that age of the car. I know like the neighborhood I live in, it was really designed so that with like two block radius, you could get to anything you wanted to on foot. But then anything outside of that, you hopped in your car and you went for a drive. So if you're going to Chris Town Mall, Something like that. And or you can hop on a plane. You're like Bonanza Airlines or Western Air. I mean, Sky Harbor being built. Terminal 1, Terminal 2. What a demolition of those terminals. <laughs> but they did save the art from Terminal 2. So, which is good. But yeah. Oh, and this is what happened to the trains. That's a really good question. So you're gonna to have to come and find out. Why don't we have trains? And look at all the planes we have. Well, not right now, but in the time when you walked to the term to the on the tarmac to the plane. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh, that's like Burbank. Yep. Where you just, I mean <laughs> you take your luggage and you pull this little cart and you just pull your luggage out of the little cart and you're good to go. But yeah, I mean this would have been a, a day when Everybody just kind of hung out at the airport. I mean, planes were still a new thing, 
And so people would just come and hang out and watch them. them. to see what was going on. Yep. Yeah, who was traveling? Where were they going? What were they doing? And so, very exciting. I love the fact that we have a shirt from Bonanza Airlines. And then let's see, because I want to hold off on, I know I, I don't want to do him yeah, quite we'll, yet. Yeah, we'll work on, yeah, that's come gonna, this that's way. So where did people live when they? That is a good question. Here. Because there were all kinds of housing, but not enough, especially for that post-war boom. All those GIs that either had stationed here, trained here, passed through in the way somewhere else, after World War II ended, they were moving here in huge numbers. And all over town, if there was a big house, it was often divided up into multiple apartments to house as many people as possible. And then you had folks starting to realize, hey, wait a minute, let's start building homes. So you had folks like John F. Long, um, Tanner, you had all these all these different Womack, all these different people coming in and starting to build a variety of homes, or even in some cases, people living in trailers just to have housing. So then you have so many different ways you could buy a house. So people coming with GI bills that came with some money. And so then, I mean, this is more specific. I love this because you have just one step above an ice box. I mean, this <laughs> is when, so like the ice house, which is downtown now, would have been one of about a dozen different ice houses around town. And you just had a big wooden box, and that was your ice box. You put everything in there. You had to have a block of ice. And so this really reminds me of like Harvard, the Cultural mm -hmm. Center and Museum, because they have spaces like this that really kind of show how did the African American community, what did their housing look like? Right. And so it was a little different, um, although they've got some cool things down there. But you know, actually, that's going to be we're actually going to have them on as a guest in February. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, so looking forward to that. And then you get to that mid century kind of that boom. This is uh, my favorite. Right. It, 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 <laughs> all I just like it for the color. <laughs> but you also get this diamond shape as well as the little Swiss Miss entryway. This is so indicative of Mary Bay. I mean, as you drive around here, really, you'll see a lot of almost fantasy with these malevolent type Now, then you come inside, that is indeed Mary Bayo. <laughs> and how, when it opened up in the late 50s, it was huge. And how John Long was really one of the first developers to really do mass planned communities. Up until then, it had just been kind of here, there, but really kind of doing the systematic whole thing for a community. Now it's unique to have just a one-off home. Right, exactly. Because Cause everything is master planned. <laughs> everything is master planned. Or it's like you can tweak it a little bit if it's your, if you're the first one there. Mm -hmm. You can be like, well, you know, give it, it's like, oh, give me the day window. But if you're moving into someone else's house, then you're getting all the things they chose or didn't choose. Exactly. So yeah, so I mean, this really just kind of talks a little bit about Mary Vale and how they would do home shows. And so they would have like an entire block, of, uh, like a whole cul-de-sac, all the different versions of the houses that you could get in that subdivision that you could go on a tour. I mean, then you have things like a 1960 Sun City opening its doors. So now a natural planning community for folks of a certain age <laughs> that still is very much thriving and went so far as now, there are so many sun cities across the country, but we were the first sun city. And you know, I've actually, there, um, I met one of the gentlemen who lives there and he's been to every other sun city. He's like, you know, I still prefer the original sun city. And they turned that original house actually into a museum oh, really? of Sun City, which is a hoot in the head. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, you can kind of see, I mean, it was that was really built on this whole idea of recreation, of community, of just getting to know your neighbors. And then here, it's just kind of like talking about the different builders and the homes they would build. 
And even you even had um, in South Phoenix, you actually had developers who were simply building homes for the black community mm -hmm. as well. Open sea, and here's like the parade of homes, so that we can go see all the options. Home week is still a big thing. Yeah. I mean, now you can go to the like the home show down at well, and any other <laughs> homes, not this yeah. show, the home show, so you can see all the other things you can do in your house. And so, you know, one thing that I just learned is if there's an open door, walk through it because you're supposed to. I've been here multiple times and never noticed out on the back porch of this little house is the washer and dryer. And it's not just any washer and dryer. It is the front loading Westing Westinghouse. House. Oh my gosh. You know how many times I've not, I almost got a pepper shaker. I almost got the point version. But these are just so iconic to the 50s that it was like when Mike and I came this way. I gasped because I'd never seen them. Never before. noticed them. Yeah, they're tucked away, and you don't think about the washer and dryer being on the back porch, right. or that we are on the back porch. Which right. here, let me exactly. try to get a oh, yeah, exactly. I'll try to get a bigger shot of the. And the so table. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've got lots of neighbors who still have their washer and dryer outside. Because who wants all that heat on the inside in the middle of summer? That's true. And we get to things like this. Scottsdale Community College and the Artichokes. And that it was almost an act of rebellion. They decided to name themselves the Artichokes as well as they said, choose the color pink and white as their <laughs> official colors. So... That's awesome. Exactly. I love how being an artichoke is rebellious. So, but you can really see here, it's like, I mean, between places where people would hang out, church, school. And of course, there always are those health concerns. Even now. This is very appropriate. <laughs> and yeah. And so, I mean, normally I'd be wearing a mask, but otherwise, if I was wearing a mask, nobody could hear me. So that's what I'm not. But Jen and Dean is wearing I do have my mask on, so you may not hear me. <laughs> <laughs> but you're saying close to the mic, so you're probably better off than I am. <laughs> so let's see. I'm thinking down. Yes, let's do, let's do it that way. Because, oh my, oh because my this is, here, yeah, so let me try to get all of, all of you in the... Oh, I turned it sideways, sorry. It's like, you got the box Which was, so the only theater, we, the only movie house we have downtown now, in downtown Phoenix, would be the Orpheum. But that would have been a handful, that would have, there would have been others as well, like the Fox. And they would have been hubs of the community. People would have come there to do all kinds of things. In fact, Lou King got his start doing a weekly musical talent show in a theater. Okay. And so Lou King launched so many careers, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But I mean, I love the fact they have a Lou King original shirt. And I'm kind of jealous of that friend. <laughs> Something you would wear. I'm, I'm feeling a little mood almost. <laughs> <laughs> you need fringe. I do need fringe. So, but, you know, but then that leads us into oh, so much other entertainment. Because <laughs> when you take a look at this, which is Gamage. the recreation of Gamage, yep. And so we're going to theater. It looks almost like that and that is on ASU's campus, designed by Frank White Wright for another location, but then, then built on ASU's campus. And so you have those those classic movie houses, and then you wind up with Mark Anthony, Seneca Pre. Now, if anyone who grew up here, I'm sure that you are thrilled to see this because you probably remember going to see so many movies here. I know I've got a ton of friends who went to go see Star Wars here, but this was kind of the ultimate theater. It was actually designed by James Salter, who was working for Hebrew Nun at the time. And so this was 
the <clears throat> last century. Oh, so modern, so much going on that, in fact, the, the Seneca Pre they, they built, from my understanding, I think still has the same red drapes, those really red, heavy velvet drapes. Um, everything else is gone, sadly. But I really wish I could have gone to see a movie. It sounds like it would have been super fun from the runway here, where you actually would have driven up to the movie palace and just dumped off the kids for a Dave adventure all on their own. That would be awesome. Indeed. Which way you want to go that way? So, yeah, let's go this okay. way. And so then you start talking about the art museum, one of those other cultural institutions. Now, a few years ago, they went through a major expansion, which really made it a lot larger. But, you know, before that, the original building actually had the library housed in it as well. And so they had collections of folks like Philip Curtis, who was a local artist actually living out of cattle track. But he did so many different styles. I mean, you can kind of see how the museum has changed over the years, and you know, and I think they're actually open right now. I think so too. I, mean, I just went to, I just went to the, oh my god, I just went to the Hurt Museum. They've got this larger than memory exhibit, mm -hmm. which closes on Sunday. Oh wow! Okay. Such a good exhibit. Oh my gosh! Probably one of the best I've seen. Oh wow! Yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize they were back open. So they. So were I didn't either. The friend said, "Hey, yeah, they're open, and you better go because this exhibit's closing." And I'm so glad I did. And actually, you're going to try and go back again, dragging some other friends. Now, they're not doing the dose of tours or anything like that. So it's more than just kind of a self guided on your own thing. Okay. But don't forget, museums are open, yes. including right where we're at. <laughs> where we are. Come see these in person. <laughs> I mean, there were people here earlier today, mm -hmm. but not like there normally is. So, okay, so we've got the art museum. And then my friend Helen, who just took over the the fashion collection or the costume institute, that leads us then into this, which is near and dear to my heart. You have Leona Caldwell, who was basically designing and silk screening her own material and then creating these really kind of resort wear. I mean, it was really stuff that was meant more for lounging as opposed to going out in. But then on the bottom of this, and they were both Fifth Avenue in Scottsdale. And then you've got Lloyd Kiva New, who was also working here. He was working at the, the Indian School and was also a fashion designer and actually wound up um, moving to Santa Fe. But it's like he became and really popularized those patio sets okay. that in the 50s became so indicative of the Southwest that it was like if you were vacationing here, you had to leave with a patio set. But the other beautiful thing was it didn't, didn't have to be necessarily by his, but it created this whole cottage industry of women having suddenly a way to support themselves. And so you would have almost every street corner having a shop that that's all they made were those patio sets. Okay. Now, one of the things Lloyd Kiva did was he brought different craftspeople from different tribes working together. And so um, Lomo was doing his silversmithing and buckles and things like that. He was working with leather makers. He was working with a wide variety of different artists, okay. um, silk screening things. And so he was really one of the first people that just kind of opened the doors and let people come in and explore. Very cool. And then from there, you then start looking at the different art books, the galleries that have proliferated Phoenix, Scottsdale, Mesa even. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, and I love all the different art books that are going on. Well, again, not right now. <laughs> not currently. Not currently. We're, we're in some much more of a reduced fashion. But yeah, I mean, how Phoenix, when they first started doing the first Friday, it quickly became the largest first Friday in right. the country because so many people were coming out. Um, you've got the, the Thursday nights in Scottsdale wandering around and then i know mesa was doing it i think every second saturday and just people kind of just wandering around and looking at art but the great thing is it's kind of just this melding of seeing and being seen and, and just hanging out with other people they're great so and first fridays now include museums 
Indeed, yes, so. e exactly. <laughs> and, and a lot of museums actually are now doing special things. I know, like the art museum was doing a lot of this, as well as the herd, were doing things to try and draw people, in, especially on a first Friday. That's when they were doing these rather large events right. to draw people in and create a destination. So hopefully, back in twenty twenty one, we will be able to do that again. Exactly. <laughs> I know. That's what I was saying. Mm -hmm. They have so many great things that should have piggybacked onto that exhibit mm -hmm. that just didn't happen. Right. So, but yeah, so so be aware in 2021, museums will be open. Um, I know earlier this year we had Chandler on and they that was just as they were shutting down to come back open again. And so if there's any questions, call. Yeah. Because I mean, there's some great exhibits here that people just aren't getting a chance to see. And some things you might not even know are here. Right. And we're talking about other cultural institutions who have things like the Phoenix Center. Then a lot of those people just kind of were like, well, you know, maybe they moved from back east. And so they were used to having certain things. And when those certain things weren't here, they made them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes starting off in a living room and then growing from there. And so that's been kind of the fun is seeing a lot of a lot of this was kind of grassroots efforts. And a lot of them, a lot of these organizations started with the women. The the women's groups were putting together a lot of these. We want to bring the culture back to, or we want to bring the culture to the place that we're living now. And we, so here we go. And that's the Phoenix Symphony and and a lot of these other uh, the literary guilds. All of those groups right. brought culture here. And you, if you're looking at the dates on a lot of the four, you're seeing a lot of the 40s, late 40s, early 50s. Right. Yeah, that big population of people mm -hmm. moving here really in the 20s, 30s. Mm -hmm. And then once they kind of got their sea legs under them, then it's like, okay, well, how do we make life better here? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And then when we get to... Everyone's favorite. <laughs> so, so, one of the cool things that I thought was this is actually from the Walls of Life of Set. Oh, that's right. So, which I thought was pretty cool. I just assumed that you guys had built it, not realizing it was just kind of a curio. We've had several different Wallace and Ladmo exhibits through the years. We do have a large collection of Wallace. Wallace and Ladmo, and so they get changed out. <laughs> Good. And so, yeah, so, I mean, you've got things. I mean, definitely here is Pat McMahon being one of his characters. As you can see, some of the other characters he would become as well as Aunt Maud, as Gerald, who is always a favorite that people love to hate. The little rotten kid who is never nice. <laughs> and then you have Lagmo. I mean, and what and so I think it's always interesting because it's like if you move people somewhere else, you don't realize the fascination of Malson. Right. But it really was it was the longest running kids program. Right. On the planet. I mean, ran from the 50s and into the 80s. And so, and Pat Man was so great at what he was doing, playing all these different characters, that at one point he actually played a band, um, Hub Cap and the Wheels, which actually became so successful that locally they were out selling the Beatles. Oh, that's funny. And because of that, it actually drew record labels looking from LA. And he had to decide, do I sign with this record label and wind up having to go to LA, which would end the show, or do I stick around and keep the show going? And he chose to keep the show going. That's a great story. Which I think is, and so actually I know um, coming up, we've got Finn Tyler coming on. I know that's gonna be one of the things he talks about. I um, he actually wrote a play about Walsh and Ladmar show. And that was kind of the crux of was using really that moment of like, okay, do we break it up or do we keep it? Do we and break that, up the band or do we? <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. And so, I mean, they even went on to their own, they had like their own hamburger shop. They had so other spinoffs. Um, initially when they started the show, there was a wall of toys from Toyland. And so a kid, if they won, would get to select the toy. But it took them so long to select that toy that they started creating Ladmo bags. That way, you, they just got a bag and then you were on. And, you know, anyone who grew up in the area still laments whether or not they got a Ladmo bag, whether they actually were on the Ladmo show. I mean, and so I just think it's so interesting that a handful of characters held so much cultural, almost heritage. 
Absolutely. For the valley. I'm a Tucson girl. I grew up in Tucson. We didn't hear anything about Wallace and Ladmo. <laughs> <laughs> but that year it was totally we had our own art icons so same thing we had very different folks but what i think what's interesting is the humor was kid and adult centric mm -hmm. so that way you didn't stop watching it once you grew up absolutely you just saw through a different lens exactly so lots of double entendres things like that and so yeah so that's how they're able to kind of keep that audience and keep growing and become again this institution right i mean pat mcmahon is still around town doing so many different things i mean but he's always so gracious to sit down and talk to people about what they're doing it's a great we get lots of questions oh i'm sure and we have do. lots of things in the archives we have lots of things in our collection so nice yeah, I know Mike was talking about maybe at some point maybe trying to recreate one of the sets or something. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to kind of when they when you can expand this. Yes. So that'll be very exciting. And then we get to one of my loves, the whole theater aspect of some of the companies. I mean, the fact that you've got Child's Play, which has been doing children's theater for oh so many years. The fact that Pink's Little Theater mm -hmm. has been around for so long. Right. <laughs> Indeed. And so, yeah. Um, and one of the things I love about Phoenix Theater is the fact that they are now playing up on so their so Canyon Records, which is the, the still surviving independent record label on the planet. It's operating right here in Arizona. Um, they do Native American music, and in the '60s they had a competition to give away a camera and a, a film camera, as well as a projector. And so kids all over submitted things. Steven Spielberg won. Wow. So now when you go through that tunnel for Kenny Theater, they now are talking about that history, okay. which I think is great because it's in some ways it's like, well, you know, we launched. Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg. That's wonderful. I mean, and so you can actually, if you, I think if you go on YouTube, you can find a few minutes of the very first movie that he made. Most of it's lost, but there are a few minutes. I think it's called Firefly. But yeah, I mean, it's like we've got such amazing theater history. I mean, and then I love how you have like a movie and for a variety of shows, kind of what's ever going on. Um, this is for a Tar Terrence McNally play. So, I mean, as theater is still trying to figure out quite how to grow and thrive i mean you've got the opera who are now doing shows outside mm -hmm. you've got other theater companies are doing that same type of thing trying to figure out how do you still offer those in a safe environment adaptability is that's going to be the motto for 2021 how do exactly. we move forward and so how do you do what you need to do mm -hmm. but do it in a new way and we're just saying possibly for technology. I mean, that's the reason why even we're doing we're this here. right yeah. now this way. So that way, and this really started off of a Facebook post of just kind of seeing people saying, hey, you know, where is that? And it's like, hey, you know, let's go. And so that way we can talk about Walsh and Land, we can talk about Maryvale and talk about so many different things that create that thread, that fabric of, of Arizona. Mm -hmm. And it's all under one roof right here, exactly. which I think is really cool. I mean, I can go on. And so now we're kind of in this little corner, kind of making a first circle. I mean, um, Seneca, I could go on and on about Jimmy Salter and some of the other buildings he's done. But that's but for another. Do we want to go to our favorite or are we going to go through one more? Oh, you know, let's go to the favorite. <laughs> so. Oh. Oh and here God. we are. <laughs> oh my and so, the reason we're here. So what a lot of people don't want. So, okay. So this Bob's Big Boy actually came from Bob's Big Boy right here in Phoenix. It was in Thomas and Central. And it was the first franchise outside of California for Bob's Big Boy. Um, my friend, my friend Gail, her dad was one of the original four that came over. Oh, wow. And so she grew up in Boston. But it was one of the anchors of one of those Saturday night cruises. It's like you went from McDonald's to Bob's Big Boy and back. 
And that's what you did on Saturday night, because you just drove this loop to see and be seen, as well as get some great food. Now, I thought it was funny when they first were opening Bob's in the early 50s, I actually got an article talking about what do they mean opening up such a high-end restaurant that was so expensive in this little tiny town called Phoenix. <laughs> And the fact that before long, it became an institution. Mm -hmm. Now there was dine-in dining as well as drive-in. Drive in. So people could come and sit in their cars and eat or come into the restaurant. Now, unlike the other big boys around, that the decor was actually very Southwest. And so there were Native American designs throughout the restaurant outside the building as well as inside the building. And they hired artists to do those. But yeah, so I, mean, I love that this is the Bob's Big Boy from Thomas and Central. Yep. That one that so many people hung out with. How many selfies would they have had back in the day were selfies a thing? <laughs> right. Well, and you know, and so really from here, Bob's Big Boy really kind of exploded and went across the country, all because of our Phoenix Bob's Big Boy. <laughs> But they also kind of let the franchise go a little bit. And so that's why you would wind up with um, Frisch's, Bob's Frisch's Big Boy. There are all these different variations. But one of the things I think is always kind of fun is this book actually came from a customer that was at Bob's. He was this little kid that would come in overalls who loved the food and he had a little bit of a belly on him. So, so they created him. So they created him. Well, there were franchises in Tucson too, because we used to go yeah, and yeah, have the same. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that was the thing. It was like, and they all spawned from this guy. So all those other bumps, big boy. He's oh. the, he's the big boy. <laughs> right there. Great. Oh, yeah. And um, you can and come see him right here. You can come to the Arizona Heritage Center. Exactly. And just a little bit, we'll actually tell you how to get here in case you don't know. Because the Arizona Heritage Center is also under the Arizona Historical Society. Yes. And so we'll also talk about that as well, in case that kind of uses anybody. But then you move from one icon of Bob Big Boy. If we go inside, I'm trying to, I think there's some. Okay, oh, yep, here we go. In the diner. Yeah. So, yeah, so you kind of get the whole, like, the food landscape of not just Big Boy, but the fact that we have the first franchise McDonald's right here. Um, and with the 10B, you had the Harmon chain, which was first, that's who spawned KFC. So, there is so much fast food history right here in Arizona. And so, we had those chains, but you also have things like Polar Bar popping up. So many little restaurants convenience was suddenly now came. It's like no longer did mom have to just sit in the kitchen and cook all day, but there were occasions where your mom might want to actually go out with the kids and all get a quick bite to eat. And then, oh my God, Green Gables, which was a restaurant that when you drove in, there would be a knight on a horse that would point you to your parking space with his lance. Lance. I was, I was, I was like, the words not joust. That's, that's what they do when you have it. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. I mean, and so this could have been like, I mean, I've got one woman that's like she's only been here went here a couple times. It was like for birthdays, and she said it was such a magical experience. Um, if it was your birthday, they would give you a little knight on a rider. That's great. So yeah, I mean, they really played up upon just that whole kind of medieval theme. Um, one of the things I love is the fact that over on Thomas, you'll still see this building with now an office building behind it. Oh, wonderful. And so I love that they were adaptive reuse and figure out how to save some of that architecture for scale, as opposed to just not it done and leave it. Absolutely. So, and then greetings from Arizona, talking about how so many people would come here to vacation, to recuperate from whatever ails you. I mean, it's like you've got places like here, like the Arizona Biltmore, 
which you can still go to. And then one of my favorite things, which I didn't realize when I started looking, is so you've got like all the Ramada Inn stuff, but because the Ramada Inn was actually based here. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. And so Glenn Gayette, who designed things like Mr. Lucky's, that iconic sign on Grand Avenue, mm -hmm. um, he had his own company. And so he was hired by Ramada Inn to do all of these things. Okay. So he did things for them all across the globe for Ramada Inn. Mm -hmm. And he's still with us in his early 90s. So, let's see what else. Um, technology. That copper, cotton, citrus climate, cattle. But it's like, I mean, computers are so quickly becoming almost an uh, their own that six C or even a new set of C's because we're not necessarily doing some of those same C's. I mean, climate is still very much an active part. Right. But agriculture is not as big as it was. Um, the livestock is not as big as it was. The mining always is kind of an ebb and flow coming and going. So kind of filling that gap is technology. Some of it being hardware, some of it being software. But so many things, I mean, especially with like some of the innovation that ASU is helping to create. I mean, the fact that like the Mars Rover mm -hmm was developed here. So it's great that people can now come into the middle of the desert and start exploring so much technology. A lot of corporations. Yeah, no, I mean, it's like, I mean, we talk about Motorola and how they were so influential when they first got here. I mean, I've got so many friends who had ants that worked here that it wasn't just men in technology, it was women in technology. And so they employed skilled staff and here you have a row of women doing some. Let's take a look and see what's going on. And the state of perpetual construction. Since <laughs> Um, do a Saturday, second Saturday walking tour of downtown. And it's always interesting to start looking at some of those 20, 30, 30s era buildings that are still there. In the middle of all these cranes building high, higher and higher. And that some folks are still valuing some of those smaller buildings. Um, you've got some that are looking at adaptive reuse, how to keep some of that scale of the building, but now integrated into a more modern use. Right. So there's lots of interesting things going on. We've been kind of a boom bust since place since really, I mean, you're talking even the teens. Mm -hmm. since I mean, there was the cop bust and then in the 20s there was just the economy bust. And so, but we're always trying, we're always coming back and thriving. And what made us really thrive? How do we live in the middle of summer? and still survive. And that's what we're looking at here. So it's not just a swamp cooler, which before they had this, they used to hang sheets out on the sleeping porches. Um, if you see some of the older homes, they'll have almost like the size of a room outside and they would have hung sheets that they would have soaked. And so that way the breeze would have come through and help moisturize things and made it so much cooler well, someone took that same technology and then put it into a mechanical version. And so pretty much you have these big sponges which just soak up water and then suck air through that, bringing in moisture. And from there, we moved into Dr. Carrier and his invention of air conditioning. The oh, best gosh. invention ever. <laughs> and they were talking about how they felt it was the bane because they were like, well, you know, if you, if you designed the buildings well enough, you wouldn't need things like this. It's true. And so I thought that was an interesting kind of a dichotomy of we're also happy to have air conditioning because we don't necessarily have six or like two foot thick adobe walls. Adobe walls, right, right. To keep us cool. But yeah, I mean, I think it's so interesting that one piece of technology that really was brought here in the late 50s really changed how people live here in the desert, across the state. 
Um, I've got friends that still have houses with a swamp cooler and an AC that they can use intermittently because this is always one. It works part time and then they kick on the air conditioner to we had, bring the temperature down. We had both grown up in Tucson. We had one of those. The house was built in the 60s and yeah. it had both. And in August, you did not want that swamp cooler on, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that picture on the AC. Mm -hmm. So I can write your broken house ahead both. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yep. Yep. So what year was house grew up in? 69. Oh, very cool. My parents built it. Uh, well, not themselves, but well, I, I, yeah. <laughs> not the, by their own hands, but when they came from Ohio, they built their house. And the house next door was really interesting because it was built just mirror image. And we were the only two houses on the street that had the same, that were almost like, you know, a site, uh, uh, what's the word I want? Subdivision kind of house, but it wasn't right. a subdivision. It was just two builder, two different houses and mirror image of each other. So when, when oh, wow. neighbors moved in that had kids that I would go play with, their house was exactly identical to mine, just on the reverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and we always thought that was the coolest thing. And now grow, you know, now when you grow up, you're it's not cool having houses the same. <laughs> you want something different. Yes. So, yeah, they look the same. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, can you wave? Because I have no way to distinguish you. <laughs> Exactly. Between the beige that's required by the HOA. Mm -hmm. and exactly. Now it would be nice to have a purple house or something. Exactly. Why do you think I have a seat on green? Exactly. Because and you can have it where you are. Exactly. How old is your house? I'm built 56. Okay. And actually, we're going to see a picture of it in just a little bit. Awesome. <laughs> so, you know, so East Road. I recently did a trip out to Goodyear and the Goodyear tire cams, which is what named Goodyear because Goodyear tires, they needed cotton for World War One, mm -hmm. And so they started growing cotton there. And so they were really one of the first outside major corporations to come in and create such change. And they only moved out. So basically they kept growing and growing to the point where they wound up with like almost half a million square foot of building space. They kept growing and they moved into aeronautics and then they became aerospace. And unlike Motorola, who everybody's heard of, a lot of stuff was going on at Goodyear was so top secret that nobody could talk about it. Okay. So I think it's always interesting that it's like people really have really heard that much about Goodyear. Uh, one of the things I think was pretty cool we talked about it last week for Christmas is, is that they made blimps and house ones here, but they also made some of the Macy's Day Parade balloons. I know, I didn't know that. I didn't think as well. Because they, they had a couple of young ladies, and they had, I think it was four of ladies who were the balloon girls. And so they just sat there and cranked out five balloons. How interesting. That's awesome. So, yeah. Um, and I've actually been trying to research a little bit more about that. That's just the other cool stuff. Because Goodyear was really going into a that kind of radar early on. So, which I thought was really fascinating and really kind of going into that hole. And then just like about all the different banks. All the banking. Yeah, I mean, when you talk about Valley National Bank. And oh, then exactly. The and you know, it was so funny. Where this would have lived. Very top of the bank. But it wasn't colored. That was the odd thing. And it's mm -hmm. like, I mean, we figured out it was the letters were lit, but because it's all metal, it would have corroded really easily. Mm -hmm. And so it was never painted. Hmm. So as, as we'll see on the other side, Do a quick if we swing around, it's like, you'll see the Valley National Bank that everybody knows, yes. which is that iconic enameled yellow and blue. Mm -hmm. Now, when it was, when, so if you ever watch the beginning of Psycho, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so they pan across the city on December 11th, All right. and you actually get to see um, the early sign that was on the Valley National Bank building, which is now the hotel. Right. 
but it was initially the bank building. And so they built a really huge one of these that was at that point the largest rotating sign on the planet. Wow. And so I think it's really cool that we had that. Sadly, we don't know where it is. There's always a story about, oh, maybe it's someone's barn. Uh, we don't have barns here that uh, often. Yeah, but likely by now it would have been wrong because it was so big. And and it's fun. And so you can still see it in that in entry to Psycho. I don't do scary movies. <laughs> I don't like scary movies, but what I like about that is it's not so scary, but it's it's scary in here. I'll have to check it out. But so, <laughs> I mean, I, I I don't do a lot of the violent things just because that's not my yeah my shtick. Yeah. But yeah, and there's a uh, Walter right there, Walter Bimson. Indeed. I believe. Yeah, so I mean, Walter Bimson. I've been with Valley National Bank. Mm -hmm. Then they moved next. It's like so basically when they built that first building. They did it on speculation because they knew they couldn't fill the entire building. So it's called the, it was called the professional building because they <laughs> would rent it out to different medical offices. And then as the bank grew until they filled the building, then they moved next door and built another building. And so, but like even Walter Bimson, it's like, if you take a look at the ones a hotel, he actually added a floor onto that. Oh, wow that you can see. So you have this like art deco until you get to the top floor on one of the arms of it. And then you realize it's this very late fifties, very mod addition. They just added on to it. Um, the securities building downtown at Van Buren and I'll say central. Um, he actually added an apartment up there as well. So you see this great like building that's very ornate and then suddenly this little brick box on top of it. And so so, so yeah. yeah so and then you know it's so funny it's like so if you stand far away and look at this you realize what this building is the oh, capital yeah. oh yeah <laughs> so it's like, oh, it's like, it's like, it's like what's what's the greek element it's other the than any of downtown and her get around as highways and byways created how we get around because no longer we traveling around on a bicycle exactly. or were we traveling on a horse and buggy but now we have roads and we're zipping along and going really fast so yeah so there's so much to do and see here at the museum now i know in just a few minutes we're actually going to talk about some of the stuff that you can do here so i think that'll be a lot of fun as we get into the trivia, but let's see. Uh, you know, why don't we go ahead and head downstairs? All right. And let's see what happens. Go back this way? I'm or are you gonna go gonna through? Go oh, we're gonna walk through. Way. Oh, you wanna walk through here. Indeed, because that way <laughs> get us right to the stairs. So here we are. So this exhibit is called Phoenix Lights. And so this exhibit talks about one night, October, March 13th of 1997, when so many folks saw what they claimed to be a UFO, ranging from Henderson, Nevada, down through Tucson. I mean, even folks like Mike Symington, local newscasters, were a part of that audience that saw it. Now, this was in 97. But you know, there is also history of UFOs when you, I mean, one of the things I think is funny is when you take a look at Dreamy Draw, if you look it up online, that's the first thing that shows up is that dam that was built was supposedly built because it was covering up a UFO crash landing site. But Valley 101 recently did a podcast um, through Arizona Central that dispels that myth. Okay. I, I don't know if anyone actually really thought it was real, but they've gone through and actually now give me the proof that it's not. But you know, if you're ever up near Kingman, there is a little town called Yucca that has the Area 66 Museum, which talks about an early 50s crash landing that was up in that area. And several spacecraft were supposedly found and they have a whole little museum donate, or dedicated to that and a really cool, I think, um, 
It's in a golf ball house. Okay. Then it's an oddity onto itself. Just do a little pan shot from up here. Yeah, now we should take a quick look at this mural. So this mural is pretty cool. So this is Maynard Dixon. Um, and was originally done for the Santa Fe Railroad, supposed to be in a ticket office. And so it made it there, but the ticket office closed, and then it moved off to the Coliseum out on the fairgrounds. And so from there, it then came here. So I think it's pretty amazing that something that is this large was able to make it through basically that many moves and still look that good. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I love all yeah, the different it's a colors. One. I mean, yeah, it's in such beautiful condition. You know, and let's just show still marching. We're not getting a chance to go through this exhibit, but it's up and really is talking about the 100 years, the anniversary of suffragettes. And so it's a great exhibit. We'll talk a little bit about some of the folks that are featured in that. And also have any good museum has a gift shop. Yes. And <laughs> we are no exception here. They keep things very, very cold. <laughs> could wear out of the building, making yourself even that much prettier. If you need a stuffed snake. <laughs> Sorry, you need a stuffed snake. Or if you want to just carry home a piece of mineral, mm -hmm. kind of playing up on that whole copper. We have a whole exhibit on mining here that we didn't go through as well. I love the fact that you could take home your own javelina. Now, these javelinas are soft, cuddly, and they don't smell bad. And they don't <laughs> so, those of you who like pigs, this is the safe way to do it. So, Oh, right. So, and I'm sure there's lots of stuff we can. Oh, actually, I can look at it. Ooh. So, all right. Okay. So, you walk down the hall downstairs. We are going to be redoing that. It, it, but then there's also, well, and you know, when you're here, you have to check out every little nook and cranny because you never know what you're going to find. I mean, if you're just suddenly walking to the library, you'll suddenly find across from that Beast of Burden talking about different animals and the relationship to Arizona. Like this first and only get a read about the camels that were in Arizona. And you even get to see a really great photo of Haji Ali, who was one of the camel carers. As well as some of the implements that were used, such as this really horrific looking spur that I can't imagine doing anything but roasting marshmallows with. And then you get a great pa painting here of the, the army on camels. And you even get to see one of the camel bells that is oh so much larger than even a cow bell. And speaking of Haji Ali, if you've ever been to Quartzite, you will know that that is indeed where he is buried. And so that's why as they've redone a lot of quartzite, they've incorporated more and more and more camels and everything. And then if you ever been to the Grand Canyon, you can see different items from the mules and really about how the 1880s was when they first started using mules as tourist vehicles and even ostriches and how popular they were, not just for their eggs, but also for those amazing feathers. And you can still see evidence of them around. That there are different ostrich ranches around, but they have such a place in Arizona history. And then one of, I thought the most interesting things was, I knew about Ruby the elephant, but I never realized she was here at the Phoenix Zoo. 
So Ruby was an animal, was an elephant who kind of, they realized if they gave her some paint, she could do things they could then sell. And so she actually was quite famous across the country as being Ruby the Painting Elephant and never realized that she was doing that all right from here in Phoenix, Arizona. Wow, and look at that, we timed it just right. So, oh my gosh, okay, so I am gonna bring on Todd because you know what, it's now midnight and oh my gosh, you know, cause it's midnight somewhere. Oh, and look, we even have Jen joining us as well. Oh my gosh, so all right, are you ready to do a quick countdown? Five, four, three, two, one, yay! <laughs> all right. So indeed, so we all coming are to you. We're all here live from the Arizona Hedrick Center, which is really cool. So happy that we can all be here. And we're going to get a chance to just kind of explore and talk about a wide variety of things. And so I'm going to keep you guys on while we actually, let's see. Up oh, there. All right. So very good. So this is our New Year's Eve spectacular show where we are kind of going through, we did a tour upstairs of the Arizona Heritage Center to kind of show you some of the fun things you can come and see. Even in the middle of all of this, everyone is very masked up. I mean, we're not wearing a mask right now because we are all in three different parts of the museum, far apart from each other. We're prepared. Though. We are indeed very prepared. So in case anybody would come in, we can all throw our mask on and all be so safe. So we are doing a special New Year's Eve show. And let's see. So I want to welcome you all. So this is our last episode for 2020. This is episode 37. Oh my gosh, you know, didn't think about that when I first started this. And I'm so excited because we're actually going to be moving into next year doing this as well. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because we've got some great fun coming up as well. Now, on this rather chilly night of December 31st, also New Year's Eve. Now, that's why we're celebrating every hour on the hour. And so I know we have a lot of you who are watching through Facebook Live. Some of you are on YouTube or even Twitch. I also want to give a shout out and say happy Kwanzaa to those who are celebrating Kwanzaa out there. My friend Clody did a great... Um, for last Saturday, did a great kind of whole musical poetry thing for Kwanzaa, which was oh so much fun. Now, you know, this is only possible because all of you out there participating, having fun, watching us, learning. And I'm happy to say we have sponsorship through AARP. Yay. And they like to say that if you're looking for ways to stay active, healthy, and informed without leaving home, AARP has lots of online offerings and virtual get-togethers. Find out all the ways that you can click to connect with your community at arp.org slash near you. And you can find things locally or even nationally that they are doing to just try to make lives a little bit better. Now, what can you expect tonight? Oh my gosh, just wait. Besides our fun party hats, because we're celebrating New Year's, we'll also have a little bit of music history. We'll do some show and tell. A talk about an amazing little town. We also have trivia. So we get to talk about even more history. And we already have our special guest on. So there is that. So if you're here for the first time, you might wonder, who is that man on my screen and why is he talking so much? Well, you know, my name is Marshall Shore. I'm also known around town as the hip historian. Now, I got that name because about 20 years ago, Actually, it was, as of this moment, 21 years ago, I was rolling into Phoenix in a U-Haul, which we talked about earlier. 
because I had just come from Brooklyn where I was working in this lovely Carnegie building. But you know what? There was snow. It was cold and I was tired of shoveling. And so I knew it was time for a different adventure. And so I traded that library for a library in South Phoenix, which was the Harmon Library, which was a 1950 building, the first branch library for the city of Phoenix library. But what was great was there was this rich oral tradition of the community that welcomed me. So I started hearing stories about the community the moment I touched down. And that was one of the main things of I started realizing nobody was really kind of looking at that modern history. So that's exactly what I started doing. And to get here, and I thought this was appropriate for you, Hall, because time is passing. And so there you go. And on we go. So when I first got here, we probably moved to a little 1956 ranch as we just came through talking about some of the Maryvale houses and things like that. So this was actually built by Womack. When we got it, it was beige on beige on beige. And it was originally, it was painted brick. And so I'm happy to say now it is seafoam and cantaloupe. Now, if you look at that kitchen, that is what my kitchen still looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile, that matching stovetop inset. Now, if you look on the wall, that's how you control the stovetop is through those buttons inset on the wall. Now, when I first got here, all I can remember how there was no history here, but I knew that wasn't true because every time I went on an adventure, whether it was on foot, on my bike, in my car, I came face to face with so many amazing people, places, and stories that it really encouraged me to do just what I'm doing. And then there's that post-war boom that we just talked about that had lots of folks moving here, looking for a new way of life, and housing was booming. So that's when you saw neighborhoods like mine, Maryvale, all these different neighborhoods were just popping with oh so many people who are moving here. And just like now, we are back again being one of the places where everybody's moving to. Now I'm also known as the hip historian and I got that moniker actually back in 2012 on February 14th which is statehood day. We were celebrating 100 years of statehood. And I was on talk of one of the most favorite events called Mask of Yellow Moon. It ran from 1926 to 1955. At its height, had about 5,000 students performing and making the show, sure the show went off. It was touted right there as Mardi Gras with something that everybody should go and see. And I was lucky enough to find three dresses in a box. These are all from the late 30s. They were designed by students at Phoenix Union and then made by Home Economics because it was very much a student affair. All the, ki all the, all the kids did skits and things like that. And so I will ask you that if you're watching on Facebook, if you want to click on that share button, so that way your friends will get a chance to see how much fun you're having as we get a chance to talk about Arizona history. Now, of course, because it is happy hour, we indeed do have a cocktail. And then let's see, I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna pop you two off for a moment while I kind of do. So this is called, so my basically my bartender PJ has made a cocktail called the Red Slipper because he was like, you know, in this moment right now, probably one of those popular movies just coming off the holidays has been The Wizard of Oz. And those ruby red slippers, there's no place like home. So we have a little bit of Deep Eddie's, ruby red, a little bit of lemon juice, a little bit of Prosecco, and I'm going to top it off with a little bit of Tapachico. Oh, I should have opened it before, so there we go. A yummy mineral water to kind of keep you hydrated. Then we have our lovely little lemon garnish right there. So cheers to the red slipper. 
Mm, nice and refreshing, just what I needed on New Year's Eve. So, and we now have some special guests here who have been with us all along. And I'm going to take you on a little trip down something you might you might drive by all the time, but not even realize. So we're going to do a little bit of show and tell. And so, you know, I've got lots of stuff in my house. One of the things I have is this big mural that's from the late 50s and comes to us from Kudia City. So this was a scrim they would have dropped down as they were doing you would come in for like dinner theater. They would have this. And I, one of the things I love about it is the fact that you have the Coco Club, which would have been at like 24th Street and Camelback. You have Kudia City itself. Basically, people would pay to advertise on this scrim. Now, Kudia City is at 40th Street and Camelback. Well, it was at 40th Street and Camelback. In fact, actually, if you look at this photo here, what we're looking at is 40th Street and the canal because Camelback is just a little bit of a dirt road that you might not even see in this photo. But Kudia came to us from Italy, stopped off in DC and did some work with them getting their opera up and running, and then came here and opened up in the late 30s a movie studio, which at first was called Sun Studios. It then quickly grew to become Kudia City. Now he was a, quite a fanciful dresser. I mean, sadly, by the time I got to stuff, there were no more fantastic bolos like what he's wearing there. But he had a grand vision of what Kudia City was going to look like. Now, they did make several movies as well as TV shows. Um, some of the Buzz Henry, some of those film clips, The Red Rider, that would be shown before movies. Back when people would go see movies at places like the Orpheum or the Fox. But then you also have TV series such as 26 Men or Dead or Alive were filmed there at Kudia City. By 1960, the land had become too valuable and had been sold off. So actually, if you're driving around in that area, you'll find a Kudia subdivision. But one of the things I love is you can always still spot where Kudia was. So just north of Camelback, on 40th Street, there is a canal. There's a bridge that goes over that canal that Kudia put in so he could easily get to his own studio. And so that plaque is still there from the city of Phoenix thanking him for having put in that bridge and also opening up Paradise Valley. Now, because we've already got our funny party hats on, we're already all here. We don't need to go down the whole modern technology because we all have funny hats on right now. So hello and welcome. I'm trying to figure out which which is the best way because <laughs> so hello. I am so happy you two are here. Happy to be here. And so happy that we are here live from the Arizona Heritage Center, which is pretty exciting to be here. It's a great place. It is. It is. It is oh so much fun. And that, I mean, we've been working on this for quite some time to get this to happen. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's and it. look at that. It did indeed happen. Here we are. Here we are on New Year's Eve celebrating all kinds of fun stuff. Bring in the new year. Exactly. Yes. We bring in the new year and lots of good stuff in this coming year. Yes. Here's and to a better new year. Look, and able to look back on some wonderful things of the past. Oh, I agree. I mean, there's it's it's been a mixed bag. So yes. All right. <laughs> I was like, wait, no, I clicked on the wrong thing. So you never know quite what's going on. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> so we are coming to you live from the Arizona Heritage Center. Now, tell us a little about the Arizona Heritage Center. Sure. So I'm Jennifer Mary. I'm an archivist here at uh, the Arizona Heritage Center in Papago Park in Tempe. And Todd is with us today. And Todd, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm the Special Projects Coordinator, which really means I wear a lot of hats <laughs> around here. But you, if you come visit, you'll probably be greeted by me and uh, the beautiful 
Poirier. Yeah. All I was going to talk about your beautiful smile. <laughs> oh, you're wearing a mask. Nobody can see your, oh, see, I keep forgetting yeah. because I see your smile, but I'm like, oh yeah, you're wearing a mask. People come in so they can't see your beautiful smile. I try to smile. You know, <laughs> eyes. I'm definitely protected by a partition. We're very COVID conscious here. It's a great place to come and socially distance. We're not getting heavy crowds and we're not doing uh, group tours right now. So there's pl um, plenty of room to socially distance and, you know, take in some history. Absolutely. And our motto is, our uh, vision statement, our, our mission statement, sorry, is uh, connecting people through the power of Arizona's history. So come and see us. This is our uh, beautiful visit. So you, uh, beautiful building, I mean. So plan your visit. And these are some of the things you'll see. Um, on the left, you see the outside of our building, which you really can't see from the street. Um, but the sign on the right-hand side, you can. Uh, we are located in Papago Park in Tempe, uh, 1300 North College Avenue. If you do the next slide, we've got a little map. Our hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, we are open right now, well, not tomorrow because it's New Year's Day, but <laughs> we are open uh, so you can come by and see us. If you need to give us a call, our phone number is there. Um, but we are right in the middle of Papago Park. So the parking lot, when you come in, it's a very large parking lot. You can get to the trails um, to go hiking back there. Um, there's a, a baseball field. Uh, there's a dog park there. So um, definitely lots of things to do in our little plaza, but you want to come to see us first. You've probably passed us before. Don't think bird museum. Remember the word heritage. Heritage. A lot. We're at the bottom of what is 68th Street in Scottsdale? If you head south, 68th Street turns into college, right at Curry. Yes. Very and good. One of the things we did want to mention is we have a new license plate, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, it's an Arizona monsoon scene, and you can get yourself a personalized plate at the MVD, um, or you can just get the, the numbers that they give you, but you want this plate because it's absolutely beautiful. And you have it's it on great. your car. I do, I do. I, I ordered it as soon as I could because I think it's gorgeous. Yeah, and it looks yeah. especially good on a black vehicle, so. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you get one today. And then the next slide, we'll tell you how to find us um, for all of our latest news, events, uh, like this one, uh, everything going on around us. Right, because I know you guys are doing some virtual events. I mean, I know, um, I don't think we had a chance to talk about Breeze, but the exhibit that he has. Absolutely, yeah, the Thomas Breeze exhibit um, will be here for a few more months. Um, I believe we've left it open since we were closed for a little while. Um, the Still Marching exhibit is here, um, and that will be here through the end of the year. Um, and we've got several new exhibits coming for the new year. Our exhibits team has been hard at work. Even though we were closed for a little while, they were definitely still um, putting things together and this is where you can go to find all of our virtual events. Um, we have uh, coming up, I believe it's January 14th, but check the website. We have our next virtual event, which is going to be working on restoring your family's photos. And so that's going to be a really good event. Oh, very um, cool. Yeah. So check out our website for all of that good stuff. Yeah, because I know we all have those photos. I know I do. I don't. I, I guess I can't speak for everybody, but I know I have those photos of like my grandparents that I think was in someone's wallet, and so it's got some bends in it and things. Yeah. Oh, Caring oh, for yeah. those, you'll learn how to do that. Yep. Oh, super cool. All right, uh -oh. and now we're getting ready for some trivia. Oh my gosh. So, okay, so now we do trivia. It's a little bit different than what a lot of people do trivia. Is here? It's more about what you know when we're done. So we'll go through all the trivia that Jens and Todd have created. We're gonna go through that. It's all multiple choice. Now you can keep track of your answers either in the chat. You can keep them if you've got a pad of paper nearby. If you have some chocolate syrup and a donut, you can write your answer on that. And each bite, I guess, could be 
a lovely New Year's celebration, but then you didn't know what you voted. So, oh, well. But, you know, that way you are you have a chance of getting every question right, even if you don't know the answer or the topic. And so that's kind of the fun. So, um, <laughs> indeed. Okay. Oh, yeah. So our first question, what is the name of the popular 1950s Arizona diner and drive-in that featured a double-decker hamburger and later became known as JB's Restaurant? Oh, and I like how there's already a hint. We talked about it on our tour of the museum. All right, so was it A, Hels Helsing's Coffee Shop, B, Bob's Big Boy, C, Sizzler, or D, Hobo Joe's. Oh, and you chose really well those answers because I think out of all of those, we only talked about one. I didn't go off on some tangents and talk about some of those other ones. <laughs> all right. All right, so question two. What were the call letters for Arizona's first broadcast radio station? That's a good one. All right. Was it A? K P E P or K P E P or was it B K F A D K F A D C K N I P K N I P or D Quick K W I K? Which one of those were the call letters of Arizona's first broadcast radio station? All right, true or false, the tallest building in Arizona was built in 72 in downtown Phoenix for Valley National Bank. Is that true or false? The tallest building in Arizona, was it for Valley National Bank? True or false? All right, on this date in 1914, what Arizona saloon keepers were frantically trying to do? Were they trying to vote? B, were they trying to create a new drink for 1915? C, were they trying to unionize? Or D, were they trying to get rid of all of their alcohol? Which one of those were Arizona saloon keepers trying to do? on this date back in 1914. And you know what I have to say to that? I would think <laughs> to that. That looks refreshing. It does. Yeah. And you know, have, we have a mocktail for you guys coming up later on, so. All right, question five. Which member of the Goldwater family acted on stage with Phoenix Little Theater? A, Robert, C, Sal, I'm sorry, B, Sally, C, Peggy, or D, Michael? Which one of those Goldwaters acted on stage with Phoenix Little Theater? All right, question six. Which of the following men was a graduate of what is now known as Carver High and became an influential City of Phoenix City Council member? Was it A, Martin Luther King Jr., B, Calvin Good, C, John Lewis, or D, Frederick, Frederick Douglass? Which one of those people was a Carver High School graduate who then went on to become a Phoenix City Council member and quite influential. All right, question seven. What famous event happened on the night of December 23rd of 1944, right here in Papago Park, <gasps> known during the war as Camp Papago, Papago Park. A, the great escape. B, the great event. C, the great Easter egg hunt in December. 
Well, that would be quite a surprise. Or D, the greatest show on earth. Well, I think actually a couple of those are possible because I'm sure it was a pretty spectacular show. All right, question eight. What Arizona waterfall was created during the construction of the Arizona Canal back in 1881 and became a hydroelectric generating station and is now popular art installation very close to Arcadia. You know, I was just talking to a friend about this and he didn't know this answer. All right, so was it A, Arizona Falls, B, Niagara Falls, C, Canal Falls, or D, Trippin Falls? So one of those places is near Arcadia and later on became a hydroelectric generating station as well as now a popular art installation with all those gears and gizmos and things. So it's a pretty cool place to go to. And question nine, who was the first woman in Phoenix to ride a bicycle? A, May Bartlett Hurd, B, Dorothy McClintock, C, Hattie Mosier, or D, Caroline Smurthwaite. Jen, how did you come up with that last one? <laughs> uh, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that when we get there. So, <laughs> All right, question 10. What city was created in the 50s as the first master planned community in Arizona? A, Saddlebrook. B, Sun City, C, Maryvale, and D, Maricopa Wells. All right, so which one of those was the first master plan community in Arizona? Question 11, true or false? The first female librarian in Arizona was Aggie Loring. Is that true or false? And for most of you, you're probably just gonna take out a dart board and just throw a dart because you might not know. But you know what? After this, you will indeed know who the first female librarian in Arizona was. And question 12, which Mesa resident was the first black woman in Arizona to hold credentials in education and as an elementary school in May and has an elementary school named after her in Mesa. Was it A, Gladys Stiles Johnston, B, Janet Harmon Bragg, C, Betty Fairfax, or D, Verona E. Johnson? So which one of those women is the first black woman in Arizona to hold credentials in education and also has a school named after her in Mesa? All right. And we're coming down to the home stretch. I mean, this is our last question of the night, but don't fret because we're going to go through those answers in just a little bit. What was the name of the 1970s television show whose signature theme song was a chorus of ho, ho, ha, ha, he, he, ha, ha? Was it A, Tom and Jerry, B, Mr. Rogers, C, Walls and Ladmo, or D, Romper Room? And you know, a hint, we actually talked about it earlier in the show. We actually got to see some clothing worn by those folks. All right. So while you're all prepping your answers, we're going to get a chance to talk about a little bit more in depth about someone else that we had a chance to talk about earlier. We're going to take a little bit of an Arizona music break and talk about Lou King, Lou King and the Rangers. Now, originally it started off in the 40s as a weekly talent show live at the Fox Theater. Before long, it then grew to a radio show. And then by 1950, he was on television. And he was hosting 
all kinds of talents. There were talks about how many hundreds of thousands of kids came through that show showing off their talents. Now, it's said that some celebrities, such as Tanya Tucker, Marty Robbins, Linda Carter, Linda Day George, even Miss Arizona, Vonda K. Van Dyke, as well as Mr. Las Vegas and his brother, Jerry. So Wayne and Jerry Newton, those all got their start on the Lou King and the Rangers show. All right. So answers ahead. Who's ready for some fun? All right. Well, before we go to there, I'm going to say cheers. Nice and refreshing. All right. So our first question, what was the name of the diner that became JB's? And of course, it's Bob Big Boy. B is the correct answer. And if you didn't get that answer, you missed the first half of the, the show. <laughs> <laughs> right, I think we spent a long time talking about Bob's because it was such an icon here in the Valley. And, and I thought it was neat that there were 45 cent hamburgers. I don't know inflation wise what that translates to today, but. Yeah. Didn't they have a, like a little fold for children, like a little coloring book or something like that? or a placemat, I remember oh, being very excited. I'm sure they did because families would have been huge. And so you would have wanted to entertain the kids so mom and dad could get a moment's peace and have have a bite to eat. And it was so awesome to go somewhere and get something as yeah. a kid, it's special just for you. Yeah, exactly. You could just color on and color on. Right, Yeah. Destroy. But yeah, no, I mean, I love Bob's Big Boy and how really that big boy gave across the country so many other big boys and that really when they first started when they first started advertising they didn't even really say what it was it was just kind of like hey there's something cool coming to this location and it became such a so quickly such an icon yeah and there he is in the newspaper ad for the first uh and you can kind of see him in the center there in the little teeny tiny box right yeah. above the big ad at the bottom. So yeah, he just totally took over everything. And I did find out for you, Marshall, the one that restaurant on Central and Thomas, it was open in July of 1955 and it closed in April of 1982. Oh, that was a pretty good run. Mm -hmm. Not what too corner bad. was it on? It was on um, that North, I'm trying to think of my, my directions because I'm kind of directionally, um, Northeast, cor Northwest corner. Northeast, Northeast, where the Apache okay. Walker statue is now. Okay. That's where Bob's big boy was. He's got that hipster hairdo before it's time. And <laughs> indeed he does. All right, question two. What were the call letters of Arizona's first broadcast radio station? KFAB. Yeah, so... They, they went through a lot of changes. Most people know him as KTAR. That's what I would have remembered um, for uh, Keep Talking the Arizona Republic was, was the call letters. The Arizona Republic purchased the station. Um, and then it's been purchased again, and it has new call letters. It has the same call letters um, now, but it's not owned by the Arizona Republic anymore. Oh, Wow. Okay, I didn't realize they had finally sold it. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. All right, question three, true or false? The tallest building in Arizona is the Valley National Bank building, not the old one. The 1972 version. <laughs> the, the new one, because it's no longer very new. Exactly, but it's still around, so. Right, and it's still the tallest building in Arizona. Yeah, there's a... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, in, in the last couple of months, there's been actually a couple of groups that have said, hey, we're going to build the tallest building in Arizona. Yeah, there's there were some petitions in. But what I was reading was something like, um, I don't remember the footage, but it was like 20 or 30 or 40 feet hot, higher than the city limit the city allows. So now uh, they're trying to propose 
this building that's not even allowable. So we'll see if that happens. Oh, we interesting. Have, okay. Yeah. But we have, um, the, I thought these were kind of neat. There's, these are some of the artifacts in our collections um, from that particular Valley Bank building from the grand opening. Um, and so we have the little desk plaque from the grand opening for someone that worked there that you can kind of see there. And uh, so I thought that was that was neat. They're they're really cool because you can see the glass building in the in the little desk plaque. Um, and just a plug for the library and archives, we have the largest collection of Arizona or Valley National Bank um, uh, archival collection. It's many many boxes. Lots of people have used it, and uh, lots of people have used it for research. And it's amazing. There's some really good stuff in there. Wow. Okay. Next time I'm coming back, we're going to go through some of those boxes because I would love to see what's in them. And uh, I think I have a photo of, of one of those coming up in another event that we're doing. So it's oh, there's some cool stuff. So <laughs> very good. Well, I look forward to that. All right. On to question four. And back on this date, back in 1914, all the saloon keepers were trying to get rid of their alcohol. Yeah, so um, there was a question in the comments um, from BK. Uh, did saloon owners have to completely close their business or did they simply convert to non-alcoholic drinks and meals? Well, it's an interesting question because I was reading a little bit about what the saloon keepers were doing and there were several loopholes in the ruling. So they were exploiting those um, and uh, you... Uh, I won't remember exact verbiage, but people were importing their alcohol from Mexico because it wasn't made on site. So that was one way to get around it. So I don't think they did change their their uh, business models. Um, they just were a little more creative in how they uh, enacted their business. <laughs> it also gave rise to species. What's that? It also gave rise to species. The places yeah. where, where, even though it was illegal to have a drink you could still go get a drink. Mm -hmm. So it was just, oh, such in the public eye. But one thing things I think is interesting, um, at one point I was talking to like one of the winemakers and they were talking about how we has to, we used to have a lot more vineyards and things here, but because of prohibition, all those were converted to crops that actually made money. Mm -hmm. They weren't able to sell the grape, so they had to suddenly quickly build something that would. That makes sense. Yeah. And in this photograph, that, those are all whiskey. That's all whiskey they're destroying there. Very sad. Indeed, because I have a glass that's about half empty right now. <laughs> exactly. Could use some of that. <laughs> exactly. Give me a great name for a bar, loopholes. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, it's actually a tie into this into the still marching exhibit because of the whole temperance movement that mm -hmm. was kind of seen by women as a way to improve their lives. So that way, if their louse of a husband would stop going to the bar and drinking every night, he would actually be home and take care of his husbandly duties, like yeah. fixing the toilet or fixing the plumbing instead of just laying on the ground drunk every night. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but I, there was, was long, but still, I mean, but the temperance movement was part of that whole suffragette movement, that whole women thing. So I always think that that's kind of an interesting kind of intersection that a lot of people don't think about. Well, and a lot of the women who were part of the different um, the different groups, the temperance groups, but then their church groups in Arizona at this time still kind of had that wild west. Uh, reputation and so they wanted to make Arizona a place that more people came to so if we got rid of that nasty alcohol you know more of the the upstanding citizens from back east would come and move here and that was a big part of the boosterism was getting more people to come to Arizona so you know let's just clean it all up and then we'll be a respectable town again <laughs> exactly it didn't work it didn't work it didn't work <laughs> All right, moving on. All right, which member of the Goldwater family acted with the Phoenix Little Theater? And it was B, 
And it, and we didn't include Barry Goldwater because he did indeed also act in some plays with the Phoenix Little Theater. So uh, we did not put him in the answers. <laughs> um, but his sister-in-law, um, th- it started as a fundraiser, but she really got very involved in acting and um, producing plays and continued on with that in her life. So um, she, it was Sally, his sister-in-law. And one of the things that I thought was also interesting, um, or one of the things that I thought was interesting when we were talking about the Phoenix Little Theater was that um, all of the Goldwater families sort of ties to Arizona. We also will, um, in Tucson, in our Tucson location, which hopefully you'll get to do one of these down there uh, sometime in the 2021 year, Um, but we have uh, Barry Goldwater's ham radio in our museum down there. So if you're in Tucson, you need to check that out. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and it's it's a really neat setup there. So if you're in Tucson, you need to check that out. Very cool. All right. So question six. Which, who was the leader of civil rights as well as a Harvard graduate? B. <laughs> and, and unfortunately, we are, um, he passed away last week. So uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about him and honor him. Um, he is one of the history makers with our uh, Arizona History League. Um, he was a history maker as of 2003. Um, he's featured in our hallway, which is being redone to add more of the history makers. So that's kind of down right now, but um, definitely uh, will go back up in some form. Calvin Good was also um, led the way locally with um, dispelling a workplace discrimination. And he was, you know, one of the things we're known for is that whole Martin Luther King uh, black eye that we have here. And he was actually part of making that happen. Martin Luther King Day holiday happened here. Yeah, that's right. That was a big deal. And that's yeah. coming up soon too. So if you if you uh, have that day off, you can thank this wonderful man for that. And we can thank him for Arizona finally recognizing Martin Luther King. 93. Yeah, I, I knew, I remember he was in the early 90s. So yeah, so he was also leading the pack when Car- for Harvard Carver High School to become Carver Cultural Center and Museum. Right. Because when I was yes. working in Harmon, I would go through and, we- and weed the collection. And if there were things that were African-American centric, I would always give them to the library there to choose what to do with them. And so that's when I met his wife, Georgie. Oh, awesome. As she was working in the library. So, yeah. So, I mean, I mean, they were, they were such, I mean, such great leaders in the community. So, all right. On to question seven. What event occurred in Papago Park on December 23rd of 1944? It was not an Easter egg hunt. You are correct. It was not an <laughs> Easter egg hunt. <laughs> but it would, it would have been a pretty good show. It was a hunt, though. It was definitely a hunt. <laughs> it was a hunt, indeed, but just not Easter eggs. Yes. Um, yes. So another anniversary that we talked about this week was uh, the 25 German POWs held at Camp Pap- Papago tunneled their way to freedom. Um, and uh, I believe there's a story about a couple of them thinking that they could get a boat and ride the canals to Mexico. So. <laughs> Um, and they, they quickly found out that there's not really water in those canals. Guys, <laughs> <laughs> whoopsies! There's no water in Arizona. Um, but yeah, so that that happened um, in 1944, right here on our in our area where our museum is located. Not right where our museum is located, but nearby. <laughs> nearby, exactly. All right. Question eight: What waterfall was created? by the Arizona Canal construction of 1881. Yes, so Arizona Falls, not Niagara Falls. Um, And this photograph actually, uh, Marshall, you'll see where it's from, our Smurthwaite collection, which we we will still talk about that connection. (laughs) 
but I actually came across this photo um, in that collection and it was mislabeled. And I was very excited because there are not a lot of photos of Arizona Falls from the early 1920s. And so this was really fun, really fun to find. Um, and if you're not familiar with Arizona Falls, I'm sure all three of us can talk about our connections with this place, but um, I absolutely love it. I think it's a beautiful place to go. And if you're a photographer, you want to go and take photos because it's gorgeous. But if you look at this old photo, it was neat even back then, because like we just said, there is no water really in Arizona. So seeing, or in central Arizona, I should say, not, not Arizona general but it's just a beautiful place to go. Um, and it's a, it's a natural waterfall that has been enhanced with some art installations. And, um, and I believe they are using it again for hydroelectric power. Um, it powers a few homes in the Arcadia area. And it's, it's such a cool space. I mean, it's such a great place. I mean, that enthralls kids and adults. And you're right. I mean, it's such a great selfie station. Yes. <laughs> so it's a great place for selfies. All right. So on to question nine. Who was the first woman in Phoenix to ride a bicycle? So this is Hattie Mosher. Um, and she is talked about in our Still Marching exhibit that we talked about. Um, she rode a bicycle around town. She was a little bit eccentric. Um, and so- A little, a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I loved this quote. She had a lady's bike, but the citizens didn't think it was right that a woman should ride one of those two-wheeled bicycles. And um, and actually, so the rumor has it that she is the ghost um, that haunts us here in our building. I have oh. not seen her, um, but I'm not a really big fan of seeing ghosts, so she probably <laughs> shouldn't come visit me. <laughs> um, but we have her daughter's diary um, here. And so she keeps track of that um, from what I've been told, so. Well, see, Jen, it's a good thing that you have Todd and I here to protect you. Yes. One of the cool topics that come up about the, the bike there is um, the discussion around um, what was ladylike and wearing trousers. And uh, I think this is where bloomers came from. Women, of course, wanted to use this new technology, and why shouldn't they? And so uh, that was the compromise. Bloomers. Yeah, because you wouldn't, you couldn't use it with a dress because yep. it would get, keep getting tangled up yep. in your. You'd be wearing a bike. Yes, yeah. exactly. Or 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 even less because it would just rip <laughs> it off. <laughs> More shocking. Yes, very unladylike. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> So yeah, no, and, and and so and I think so. Isn't Hattie? Um, she's featured in the still marching exhibit. Yes, yes, and this is her bike, and it is, the actual bike is in the exhibit. So if you want to see this live and in person, come visit. And all right, what city was created as the first master plan community in Arizona? The one we talked about. <laughs> Indeed. So we did talk about Maryville and I just kind of loved this photo because you can really see exactly how it was laid out, master planned. I mean, this, this is not unusual for um, looking at Phoenix and most of Arizona today, but this was really unusual. This photo is from 19, I believe 1958, this aerial. You don't, you didn't see this then, you know, you didn't see houses so close together and you didn't see um, master planned communities back and then. And so so almost waves of streets and just kind of. They really went off the grid, you know? Yeah. 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 And you can see in the, in one of these, in this newspaper ad, um, 700 down got you this three bedroom house. Three bedroom. <laughs> wow. How many people would love to put that down now and get the same thing? Exactly. Exactly. On 19th and Bethany, no less. <laughs> yeah. Or I mean, that's just, that's just down the, yeah. up the street from me. So now where did Maryvale get its name from? Uh, John Long's wife. Um, he decided his wife had a good name. So they would, <laughs> so he named it Maryvale. <laughs> <laughs> you go, Mary. Yeah, so you know, 
If your name exactly. is Mary, you can you can be proud of the name. <laughs> it be named after you. Well, there you go. <laughs> All right. Question 11, true or false? The first female librarian in Arizona was Aggie Loring. And so this one, I, I will argue that she was the first, and I may get some, some pushback on that because technically the first female was um, uh, Estelle Luttrell, the U of A librarian, but she wasn't until 1904. And we have the Loring letters, and Mrs. Loring was writing these letters, as we have here, that she was named librarian for the 200 books in her husband's store um, by the literary society that she belonged to. So... I, I'm going to argue that I think she was the first. And uh, this, the Loring family also has um, connections to that Smurthwaite because um, as Marshall and I both sit on the board for the Pioneer Cemetery Association, the Smurthwaite home sits on the property of the cemetery um, and the Lorings are buried there. So everything comes around in a circle. But uh, yeah, it was, it's an interesting because the, first territorial library um, was brought here in 1863. Um, so about whatever, 16 years later, she had a, a library in her husband's store. Now, I don't know that it's the same books um, because the state library was, the state librarian was Mulford Windsor and um, it was enacted in 1915 as a law librarian and then became what we have today as our state library. So I don't know what happened to the Loring store or the books in the Loring store. It's something I'm I'm looking into and, and interested in finding out more about. Hmm. Yeah. All right, question 12. Who was the first African-American woman to have her cr teaching credentials as well as have a school named after her in Mesa? That was Viora, Viora Johnson. And Todd has a very cool story about her. I do, I do. First, I want to like, I have to actually uh, check my notes because she's got, she's so accomplished, valedictorian of her high school, uh, class in Navasota, Texas, graduated magna cum laude from Prairie View University in Texas, um, where she learned a degree in, earned a degree, degree in elementary ed education, from Arizona University and completed additional graduate work at University of Arizona. So she went to both. <laughs> she has, <Yeah. laughs> you know, you, you're not supposed to do that, I don't think. But, yeah. uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, what's cool about her is that, you know, she moved here very young to teach at um, Arizona's segregated schools. So she taught at Booker T. Washington School in Mesa. Yes, Arizona was segregated, folks. And, um, the great thing is that she taught fleets of, of people throughout her career, black and white, through, through desegregation. And what's cool is my, um, you know, my mother and all of her sisters had her as elementary school teachers, and I got to have her for Sunday school. Oh, wow. She always had those, those pin curls there and, and uh, her, her Texas accent. Very, very sweet Texas accent. And of course, you know, this is one of those things like um, there's a very accomplished black community in Arizona and amazing people have come out, come through like, like Vera Johnson. And I would just like to remind black Arizona that this is your, your museum too. Um, I'm very proud that she is featured in this exhibit and it's important to uh, remember that we're all part of history as it's happening, and um, just a great, just what a great lady! Absolutely, black girl magic back in the day. <laughs> Absolutely, and she is in our still marching exhibit. Yes, yes. very cool. All right, and our last question, what was the name of the show with a chorus of laughter as the theme song? Yes, another one we talked about quite a bit. Because <laughs> <laughs> how can you not talk Oh, ha, ha, he, he, ha, ha. Oh, 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 ha, ha. 
Indeed. Thank you for uh, letting us do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, super, so super fun show. And lots of uh, famous Arizonans were on the show. Um, anybody who's watching who was a Wallace and Ladmo fan, you'll have to let us know who else you remember seeing. Um, and there's a Ladmo bag that comes from our collections um, that Marshall talked about. Um, funny story that I heard about the Ladmo bag um, in our collections is that it actually still had the candy in it. And oh. so, yeah, that needed to be taken care of. <laughs> well, it always had a Twinkie, I think, and a Coke in there, oh. like a single Twinkie, man. You, oh, you'd watch the show and you'd be so envious of the kids on that show. I got that Twinkie. <laughs> yes, I got that Twinkie and uh, all that thing in one bag. and. You All know. the unhealthy stuff in one bag. <laughs> well, I'm sure that Twinkie was still good. I was still good. Yeah. I, yeah, the, the one I heard about had candy in it. Oof. So After 50 years. Real. Yeah, candy doesn't last very long. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, thank you two so much. Um, do you want to say anything else about the museum? I mean, it's like we talked a little bit about the Breeze exhibit, a little bit about the still marching. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some really cool stuff that's going to be going on that's still going on for a while. Um, we've talked about how museums don't forget that they're open still. Absolutely. And museums across Arizona are very much still being very socially conscious and masking up as well as having lots of wipes and things like that so that we can go experience museums. Absolutely. And if you flip to the next slide, you can just, it's our website. Um, we are allowing people in, so you do have to get a ticket, a timed ticket. It, well, not a timed ticket, but a ticket um, just so that we can keep the numbers to, you know, um, the levels that the state allows us so everybody can still social distance and enjoy. Um, but let us know that you want to come in and we'll get you in and it's uh we hope that you will enjoy what we've right. worked really really hard to put together for you and in a perfect world we the, the the facility is beautiful but outside is wonderful too and we perform weddings outside and uh, all kinds of events we have a caterer on the property as well and uh when the time comes and we we're able to 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 have events, please keep us in mind. Absolutely, and and you know even come come now and you can check out our our patio area and there's some like I said there's some great hiking behind our building. Got um, a green belt. Got a green belt, yeah. Information well, about wildlife. Sandra Day O'Connor's house, which is now pro on property. Also, oh, that's so amazing that her exactly. modern house was cut and relocated to here. That's true, that is true. You can't go inside, but you can walk around near right. it. Right, which is still pretty cool. I'm able to oh, yeah. see a modern Adobe is pretty darn amazing. Now it is a different entity, so you have to schedule a tour with Sandra Day of Honor House. Oh, I do a separate entity. Yeah, they are not part of the historical society, no. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. See, look at that. We're all learning stuff every day. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. but come get your membership. Absolutely, so, yes. Members get access to all of our locations, which hopefully we'll be showcasing on another Marshall Shore um, yeah. event. But members get access Sanguinetti to house. yes the sanguinetti house in yuma um our tucson location um and our flagstaff uh pioneer museum also so you want to check in about membership you can see that on our website as well and our yeah. membership coordinator yeah. is wonderful right and there'll be more information there about some of the other like the fixing photos type yes, the event. as yep. well as um and i know you <laughs> Right. As well as I know you had mentioned that there is a Breeze exhibit, basically connected to the Breeze exhibit. Breeze is going to be talking virtually. That's to right. So that's going to be really exciting because, I mean, you know, I love how he mixes kind of his his own tradition with that history to create something completely new. Like you can come and see in the exhibit, which is pretty amazing. 
Yeah, then you need to see that exhibit also. It's awesome. Indeed. All right. So now before I send you off, guess what? It's almost the top of the hour. So are you ready? Yeah, kind of exciting. So if only I knew how to get the seconds on my phone, I'm like, <laughs> I'm getting a new phone. I'm like, eh, all I know is it tells time, but all right. So let's get ready. So five, four, three, two, one. Yay! Yay! Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Oh my gosh. Ah, oh, thank you to so much. Because, you know, honestly, without you, this wouldn't have happened. <laughs> well, thank you for being here. We enjoyed it. Oh, my gosh. I mean, when, to when Todd called me, like, I'm on my way home in the middle of the night at one point and says, hey, you know, what about doing this? And I'm like, I've been looking for something really cool to do on New Year's. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought this to the table. Wow. And, I mean, and really kind of shepherd, and you two have been shepherding it through to make sure that it kind of really did happen from the very get-go. Connecting people. Exactly. That's what the power of Arizona's history. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because there's so many amazing stories. Absolutely. So, Lots of flowers in the desert. Indeed. Well, again, thank you two so much. And I will talk to you in a little bit. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Oh, my gosh. That was so much fun. You know, I love hanging out with them. And so, you know, again, you might have been wondering, is this show going to be worth sharing? Well, I hope you now see that indeed it's been worth sharing because of all the great stories and information that we've been sharing and the fact that we've been doing New Year's every hour on the hour because, you know, although I realize my hat keeps, I think, sliding down. So... It's not quite as festive. So now we come to a part that I really like called Little Arizona. So, you know, pre-COVID, I was supposed to be working on a book that didn't really happen, that almost got pulled, but I just heard from the publisher that Little Arizona is back on this calendar. So we're going to be coming up with a whole new set of guidelines and to make sure that happens. But I love Little Arizona because growing up in a very small town myself, I kind of understand that affinity of being in a small place. And so this segment has sponsorship from First Family of Arizona. You can track them down on Facebook or on their website. So please take a look. I know they have lots of virtual programming coming up, which is really exciting. And so this time we are gonna talk about, you know, I decided to go base more on a name. And so we're gonna talk about a little town called Eden which is just north of Safford, off in Graham County. And so Eden was really kind of, it was developed as a Mormon settlement back in 1881 and was literally named for the Garden of Eden. I mean, you can see some of the buildings that are still standing including the cemetery, which is just on the outskirts of town. But, you know, it then became, in the early 1900s, known as the Jewel in the Desert, where a three-story Victorian hotel was created. And then they added a swimming pool that was the largest in Arizona. And then later than that, they even then concreted it in so it was said that when this photo was taken, it held about a million and a half gallons of water that flowed through that into pools and tubs and mud baths, kind of across the spa-like treatment. But sadly, in 2008, the hotel caught fire and burned. Now the hotel, now the, the town itself has been on and off now, the hotel back in the 70s basically became a nudist colony and then later on became a retreat for an environmental group called First Earth 
as well as another group called Brockus. Now, I think one of the most interesting things is that there was a period of time where it seems that the Rolling Stones, after a concert, came to stay at this resort and wound up becoming part owners. So sadly, they are not still part owners and I have not heard of anything that they're trying to rebuild kind of like at Castle Hot Springs where there has been a huge effort to bring everything back. But you can kind of see what some of those buildings look like around there. I mean, it's definitely a place I'm definitely going to stop back by. I mean, you've got the church right there. So I definitely want to take and spend some time in Eden. It may not be the Garden of Eden anymore, but it still looks pretty spectacular and full of Arizona history. So, you know, this show is only made possible because of all of you out there watching. I do have a sponsor in AARP, and they say that if you're looking for ways to stay active, healthy, and informed without leaving home, AARP Arizona has lots of online offerings and virtual get-togethers. You can find out all the ways you can click to connect with your community at aarp.org slash near you for a wide variety of different activities going on. So what's up for next year? Well, we've got some surprises, but I do want to say next Thursday, we have Eduardo Pagan, who is an ASU history professor. So I'm kind of fanboying because I knew after this, it's like, well, how do you start a new year with the same level of energy as what we've got here? And so I threw a note off to Eduardo, who was part of a program called History Detectives. He's written several books. And so that's going to be a super fun show. And who knows where all we will go and what stories he will share with us. Now, also, I want to remind you that we have our second Saturday tour coming up of downtown kind of a haunted history tour of Phoenix. And you can find information on that on hiphistorian.com. And there's what my website looks like. Now, also remember, if you have stories or suggestions or comments that you're not able to put in the comments, please, you can share those via email. And here is my email. You can reach out through Facebook at hiphistorian.com, at hiphistorian. Um, also hitting me up on Instagram, as well as even good old-fashioned email works. So again, thank you all so much for being here. Now, as we do our last sign up for 2021 or 2020, as we get ready for 2021, which is going to be really exciting, I am actually going to end on a little something different. And so we are going to get to see an old Dristan commercial. When hay fever pollen invades your sinuses, brings runny nose, watery eyes, take Dristan. Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. That is, Dristan helps you breathe free and easy, as if you were far away from pollen or allergy irritation. Yes, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Helps dry, runny nose, itchy, watery eyes. You see, Dristan tablets shrink swollen, congested nasal and sinus passages which cause runny nose and watery eyes. So you breathe free and easy fast. So when pollen invades your sinuses causing hay fever miseries, don't wish you could be in sunny, dry Arizona. Just remember, Dristan's like sending your sinuses to Arizona. Get Dristan decongestant tablets.